If you're some sort of an engineer by day and not really using your skills to build your own instruments, this episode is exactly for you. 3Tom Modular is a small company in Belgium. Tom is an engineer. His background is not really in audio circuits, but he is building PCBs for a living. But then one day he just decided I'm going to build my own filter. And while I'm at it, I'm going to add some features that will make this 4HP filter really stand out. So we went through a lot of details from the process. Where did it start? How did he come up with the circuit itself, the design, the interface, the marketing, the manual to explain how the thing works and how to build it if you're taking the DIY kit. We're even looking into the block diagrams and dive in to understand how he actually managed to create these large sweet spots on the range of the knobs. Without further ado, I'm Rui, this is the SynthUX Academy, and this is Tom Froschoten from 3Tom Module. About two years ago, I, I met a guy called Steve here on Facebook. And he was looking for somebody to build a uh, kit for him for an, another MS20 based filter. And at the time, I wasn't really making my own modules, but very much into uh, synth DIY. And so I proposed that I could uh, build the kit for him. But uh, me being in Belgium and he being in the UK, that turned out to be a bit expensive. But we we kept in touch and as we talked, uh, Steve told me that actually due to some uh, physical constraints, he could only have a, a single 84 HP uh, rack at the time. And so single row 84 HP. So in an ideal world, he'd had the, the kit he wanted me to build back then was eight HP. And so he was telling me because he had so little space available uh, in an ideal world, it would only be 4 HP. And that kind of triggered me, uh, made me think like, uh, that's a nice challenge. Because, yeah, I, I am an engineer. Uh, I am schooled in electronics. I do design PCBs professionally. So um, that part of the assignment wasn't really challenge uh, so that that's something i do often uh, i've never designed for for audio let alone synthesizers so it's it sounds like a fun project and then um yeah one filter in 4 hp was a bit too simple so i, I told him you know what i will uh we'll put two filters in there and some extra stuff because why make something that's already available and after about a year of development and, and uh, uh, me and Steve talking regularly, um, Steve's MS-22 came to be. That's cool. So how do you start designing? What, what is your creative process when you're approaching a challenge like this? Yeah, so th that's something that's still evolving. Um, based also on the things I've learned by, by doing the MS-22. So the MS-22, I designed mainly in simulations in LTSpice. And then I um, went straight to the board. And so there was no breadboard involved, uh, which is a bit, well, slightly atypical, I hear. Um, and then there were about three iterations of the board. And then suddenly there was a final version that uh, I was very happy with. But uh, looking back with the, the, the four layer deck uh, that it consists of, and so got one here, mm -hmm. probing on four layers. And let's say if you want to probe on any layer, but the last, um, and you need the last layer to be present, to measure what you want to measure. Mm. Um, yeah, that's a bit of a pain in the ass. Then you have to start uh, soldering wires in between. And so you can, you can measure whatever you, you want to look at. And so that part of the process is something that I, uh, I wanted to improve upon. And 
So currently uh, I'm taking a break from production to work on new stuff and I've completely, well, for a big portion, I've rethought how I wanted to go about this. I still, I'm definitely don't want to use a breadboard because that uh, gives me a bit of stress, to be honest. And um, what I'm doing now actually is uh, making little functional blocks and commit, committing those to board, then characterizing them, seeing uh, if they perform as my simulations predict, and if not, uh, what corrections I need to make. And so, yeah, I take notes in a, a Google document where I uh, put in all my uh, findings and then and scope images, uh, reports from the audio analyzer, uh, stuff like that. And so the, these boards look a bit like this. I, I have a, quite a few of them. I so currently have two lying on my desk. And the nice thing about this is that I have a, a kind of standard uh, version as they are, as I have them assembled. And then if I find little mistakes or unwanted behavior, I can take one of the other boards and patch that. And like that, I can easily swap uh, between those versions to compare. And also, so eventually where this is headed, uh, the, the, my new module idea will be a, 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 yeah, a set of these little modules which I've characterized. And so either I can multiply a few of them to create a big patch on my desk that I want to put in a single module, or I can start cherry picking like, hey, let's try that iteration. Let's try that iteration, see what works best. And so I'm, I'm going to make a, a patch of these little modules. Um, and then when I'm happy with that, I'm going to turn that into a big module that would be a new product. Right. That's actually interesting to think about it this way you're creating these building blocks and committing to them so you don't really need to deal with it anymore and then it's more of a conceptual level of design thinking how do i patch these to get to what i want and if i need to create maybe another yes. module to commit to then i can do that um i see a few advantages so uh, the first and and the one i also see being used in a professional con text is that I'm creating a library of functional building blocks. So I, I have a little wave folder, I have a little VCA, I have a little mixer, uh, which are not very interesting as products by themselves because there's plenty of there out that and there's no point in releasing that. Um, but they're verified and you verify them, you know, you can depend on them. And um, in the future, whenever I will make more products, I can just copy paste them out of my library and I can trust that they're good. There will be no uh, big surprises there. Yeah. And so the, the second advantage is, as you say, I can, uh, it allows me to start thinking about the module more conceptually, functionally, rather than directly starting to design it at the at the hardware level, let's say. Mm -hmm. Because uh, that's a, the, the end user does not care about the hardware level. It does not care. They, they do not really care about which chips you use. Well, of course, there's a set of people who are into this, mm -hmm. but... I'm pretty sure that the the majority of of users is mainly interested about ease of use and sound rather than which which components I ended up using. And so I'm decoupling that um, from the product a bit <laughs> and and I hope that in that way I can design something that's closer to what customers will appreciate. Yeah. And you, you already see that a bit with the MS-22. Uh, it's, I've put a lot of effort into um, tweaking the range of the controls. 
So there's also the, the calibration procedure is very elaborate as a, uh, some DIYers will tell you. Um, but the upside of that is that the, the range of the controls on the front panel, they are very well mapped to what's musical and useful. And so the, the, the filter, in my opinion, is one big sweet spot. And I, nice. I do think that's part of the reason of its uh, modest success, let's say. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine when, when we're buying something from Korg or Arturia, it's basically just like this. It's like it's refined. Everything is uh, set in such a way that it's supposed to be pleasing in any, in any position. Uh, and in the modular world, it can be a bit different, of course, because a lot of it is DIY and people are just experimenting with things. And it's pretty interesting to uh, to see this approach of like really trying to finalize it to a point where it's like everything is a sweet spot. That's that's a cool way of looking at it. Um, yeah, so, so it's yeah. also a bit of a benchmark for me if, if whenever I get other modules, um, a good module, in my opinion, is something that complies with this. So that easy controls, big sweet spots. Um, whenever I, I feel like ah, the range of this knob is not what it should be, that's a bit of a turn off for me personally when when I get uh, new modules. Yeah, you expect the engineer or the designer to make decisions and not say this is like you can do everything with this. This is this is how it should sound like. I designed it for you and I tweaked it for you so you can just play with it. Yeah, I appreciate this approach. I'd like to see the interface of uh, of the module if you can uh, share it on the screen. Yeah, sure. Give me a minute. So, um, yeah, there are six knobs on the front panel. Uh, can you see my mouse pointer, by the way? Yeah, I can. Okay, I'll start over. So there's uh, six knobs on the front panel uh, from the top to the bottom. And this is the um, low pass cutoff knob. This is the high pass cutoff knob, also called the spread because it can be uh, switched into a band pass filter to get together with low pass filter. The resonance knob, the gain knob. And then we have two attenuators for uh, incoming CV. And so the, the first uh, incoming CV is the FCV that goes to the low pass cutoff filter and it's attenuated by the, the bottom knob here. And then there's also the auxiliary CV and that's attenuated by the, the knob on top of it. And so the FCV moves the, the, the top knob with uh, CV. Mm -hmm. And with the switch next to it, you can link the high pass filter to it either 100% or either uh, 50%. And like that, you can create a band pass filter of which you can control the band with, with the high pass knob at that uh, point. Mm -hmm. And then FCV is also normal to ACV. And then that uh, CV source can be patched to uh, the high pass cutoff, the resonance and the gain with these little switches. If you flip them up, the attenuated CV is added with a positive sign. If you flip them down, it's added inverted and so negatively. And yeah, so th this was one, this was a major addition to the original concept of a single mm -hmm. filter. <laughs> and um, this makes the module a lot of fun in, in very little space because it, it saves you already quite a bit of patching on the outside. And so uh, even though it's small, it doesn't require you to, to put it in an ecosystem with uh, utility modules, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and you can do a lot of stuff with this. Eh? So if you uh, put in an envelope, let's say, uh, give some CV to the cutoff, but also to the gain, you, you have a kind of low pass gate uh, going on, for example. I also know people who like to give a bit of, um, when they put in an envelope, a bit of CV to the resonance so that 
uh, when the, the attack of the note is there, uh, it, it, it speaks the resonance a bit. So it, it adds to the attack, but then for the rest of the note, it's, it's more mellow, more gentle. Very cool. Um, and there's lots of stuff that you can do with this. Um, also as, as a drone box. Eh? So because uh, past 12 o'clock, the resonance goes um, into self-oscillation. It, it throws the filter into self-oscillation. And it can go very, very deep. So that's something that the traditional NS20 filter will not do for you. And it it has very interesting timbres of um, of droning of, of resonance, especially when you bring the the cutoff uh, frequencies of the filters close to each other, then they they will start to fight uh, for dominance, mm. and and that's a very interesting sound. That that's something like a dialogue modem from hell. Uh, <laughs> if, you, if you if you combine that with uh, with the big reverb or or a clouds, let's say that yeah. that's can be quite quite interesting. It's it's a it's a really really small module for someone like me who is really into a uh, standalone, which you cannot really see here, considering the fact that I have only my modular here. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever consider making a larger version of it? Yes, I did. And people keep on asking me, yeah? so it, it, it's bound to happen sometimes. Um, also, if I ever end up doing that, I think I might just make it stereo while I'm at it. Um, but uh, the thing is, um, getting into this market as a new builder, if I had made this 8 HP, I'm not sure that anybody would blink an eye because there's so many 8 HP filters in there that have lots of functionality. Um, I felt like uh, I'm pretty sure not anybody can do a four layer sandwich and cram all of this into four HP. So I, I kind of wanted to set the right tone when uh, getting, getting started. And that's why I, I was very confident about the, the four HP format. Uh, for yeah, for follow-up products, I feel it's less important to to keep to this uh, 4HP format. But mm -hmm. to make an opening statement, let's say, I think it it was a, a smart move. Yeah, but I can totally even see it going outside of the Eurorack box. It's it's I mean just adding a distortion circuit or a mixer before it, and it becomes an effect box that you can use for a lot of different uh, purposes. It can be patched, but it can also be, um, yeah, you can, I bet you could use it for a bass guitar or for a guitar or for vocals and other things. Or maybe I'm wrong. It so happens uh, yesterday, I tried it with a bass guitar and a guitar with a, a Befaco instrument interface. Yeah. And yeah, it, it's interesting. But it's it's difficult to get it in a sweet spot, I'd say. Because, right. Uh, by its nature, um, a guitar signal and a bass signal is way more dynamic than an oscillator, let's mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. So I think for that to to work well, uh, it needs some comp compression going in. Right. Yeah. Um, that's not a that it didn't sound very nice but um so i i do play bass a little bit um what what annoys me a bit about that combo um is that it's a bit difficult to predict what you're you're going to get out so uh, the, the finger feel is not ideal i need something that's a bit more a bit less sensitive let's say to well, maybe sensitive is, isn't the right word, but a, a bit better tuned to the range of dynamics when, when playing with your fingers. Yeah. Uh, so that you can go from rather clean to dirty in, in a repeatable way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But who knows? Uh, um, I think one of the main, main uh, 
important things for me in in all of this endeavor is being able to be creative so um although uh it might be a good move financially to make a bigger version make this into a, a guitar effects pedal uh, let's say um that's not really the main goal of Triton modular for me it's yeah. mainly to add new stuff so add new stuff to the ecosystem of the this euro rack and who knows maybe in some time i i might still make that bigger version but i think um before that i'm going to throw some new products out there which are quite different from this filter cool do you wanna do you wanna share what what's on your bench at the moment or should we go to the uh, the the process that led to the ms20 mm, there's not really well i can quickly show something but it's not that impressive because it's a bit it's disassembled right now um so you know i have these illuminated blind plates right uh, yeah so these these ones uh Maybe, so, maybe do you have the words, nice. uh, maybe do you have a picture of them to show on the screen? Um, yeah, let me see. <laughs> so these are the blind plates we're talking about. Yeah. And so I'll, I'll get a bigger version going. Um, so they have um, they're back illuminated, so they have. It's an interesting concept. Eh? So it's a front panel to which to the back eh, there is a an electrical circuit as well. So it's it's a two in one kind of design, and um, the circuit on the back is laid out in such a fashion that you can't really observe it from the front. And so you can eh, there's you can put power connectors here, LEDs along the sides, and then. This illuminates the inside of your case and the light can seep through through the translucent part of the blind plane. So although this was quite nice, um, the efficiency, the optical efficiency, let's say, of the light uh, bouncing around in your case and then coming back outside was not super efficient. So um, yeah, I, I like these a lot, even though as a product uh, yeah well it's it's only a small product let's say um but but still i like these a lot uh, there's a lot of people who like them because blinky lights uh, people like pretty lights so yeah. I, I decided that i had to improve them at some point and uh, so i'm i'm working on that and so these are the oops these are the new ones that I'm working on, um, those work with direct illumination. So with a, another PCB that right. directly illuminates the, the, the blind plates. Um, I, I do have some pictures, but I have to swap screens. Give me one second. So here you see them side by side and you can see it's quite a big difference. The, the, the Technomancer on the left uh, bar it looks barely illuminated compared to uh, the new one. Yeah. And what's also nice is that there's a, a dip switch on, on the back that allows you to select the color of uh, the left and the right sides separately. So you can, uh, you can personalize it in a way. Pretty cool. And what are we seeing on the left side there? Um, these are, um, yeah, these are little blind plates uh, that I'm also selling. Um, there's a front side as well um, that contains a, a translation between our alphabet and the Braille alphabet. And this was actually inspired by um, a customer who told me he's, um, he's legally blind but he still wanted to get a kit and um, a full DIY kit. Um, and he was going to build it with a friend. And I, I found that so inspiring. I cannot even imagine what that must be like. And he also told me, yeah, you know, um, what I've heard from this filter, 
And so the sounds I've heard on YouTube, yeah, I really like them. <laughs> and I thought that was a huge compliment because if a, if a blind guy tells you who likes what he hears. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So that kind of uh, inspired me to, to make this blind plate. And then on the back, uh, there is this secret message in Braille. Um, the fun thing is that um, these dots that you're seeing, they're not silk screen, so they're exposed copper. And if you put solder bumps on there, it actually becomes somewhat readable to somebody who, who reads uh, Braille. What is a solder bump for someone who doesn't uh, know? So you put a little bit of solder on the exposed copper. And, um, and so it's a flat surface. But then because of the surface tension and the copper being there, it becomes a, a spherical little bump. Yeah. And that's so it's just like you would... Solder. Yeah. So, so, so it's just like you would solder um, uh, a component, but without a component. But without a component, yeah. and then so the bumps uh, form the the relief that's uh, similar to to Braille on paper. Yeah. I, I'm guessing. Uh, so I'm not a Braille reader. I, I uh, chuck these together in a relatively short amount of time because I wanted to include the, this with this customer's package at the time. Um, so it may not be perfect, but I, I kind of like the, the sentiment of the message uh, put into them. I think, I think that's beautiful. It's a beautiful story. It's, it, it's nice to see how, how people come up with ideas to serve uh, other people because they feel like inspired by something, by a story. And it's like, yeah, it's, It's beautiful. It's really cool. Um, let's yeah. Some some customers really amaze me. Uh, I hope I also have one customer uh, by the name of Bertolt Meyer. Mm -hmm. uh, you may have seen him. He's the the guy with the prosthetic arm, but he also yeah. has a version of that prosthetic arm, which allows him to send CV from it. Yeah, and he he does these performances and. There's a video of him on Instagram soldering an MS-22 kit with his bionic hand, which totally blew my mind. Yeah, it's uh, uh, he's he's actually on my list. I talked to a friend of mine. He was like, "You really need to check this guy out." I was like, "Whoa!" <laughs> yeah, it's it's brilliant. Yeah, it's definitely. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, let's get back to the, the MS-20 and like the process uh, that led towards it. You hinted in the conversation we had earlier um, that you are sketching quite a bit before you come to the final uh, design. Maybe you can share some of these uh, sketches with us. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So um, as you'll see, a lot of my notes and the filter topology and such, that's all sketch on an iPad. Um, I like doing this. I like drawing. Um, as a as a kid, I was very much into uh, drawing. Let's see if I can. So this is actually the first sketch of the the block schematic that uh, I showed to Steve. Um, Yeah, it ended up changing a little bit also because it was a bit difficult to interpret. Um, but yeah, this is one of the first uh, records of me putting down the, the conceptual idea of the module without looking at the what's needed on the hardware side to actually do so. Yeah. Um, so can and, you just go yeah. through quickly where, uh, how, how the signal flow works here? Yeah, sure. But let me do so from the, the final uh, version because okay. that's a bit easier to explain. Sure. Uh, it's a bit less cluttered. So um, we have the, the input here on the left side. It's coming to... Oh, I'm, not, I'm not seeing this. No? Uh, no? You're not seeing my mouse pointer? I am seeing your mouse pointer, but I think you're looking at a different screen now because... Oh, oops. Hold on. Uh, is, me... is it this one? The, uh, now it says uh, filter topology. Yes, yes, that's uh, okay. correct. So there was just a lag. Okay. 
Okay. So we have the input of the filter here on the left side, and then it's going to a VCA, and then on to the low pass filter. The low pass filter has a feedback pot with clipping and another VCA, which uh, enables the resonance. And so resonance is basically feedback for a filter. Then the output goes to another VCA in between the two filters and then to a high pass filter, which also has the uh, same resonance circuit. And the gain CV controls both VCAs at the same time. So what's nice about this is that it makes sure it makes sure that there is a nice gain staging in between the filters. So if you, uh, let's say you want it to sound dirty, it makes sure that you're not completely blasting the input of the low pass filter and then only having moderate gain in the next stage, because that will yeah, that will not sound so nice or less warm, let's say, because uh, there is much more clipping going on. And by gain staging it this way, um, you'll have more subtle distortions of both stages leading to a kind of better rounded product at the end. And because the, the gain knob uh, that also sends CV to these VCAs, uh, they make sure that for the whole range of that knob, uh, it's actually sounding pretty pretty good because mm -hmm. of this gradual increasing uh, gain stage. Yeah. Then similarly, the the resonance of both filters is controlled by by um, a similar CV source, and that also has similar effects. Uh, which is all, what is also a bit remarkable is that the the order of the filters is reversed compared to the original MS-20. Right. Um, the reason for this is because I, I really didn't know about the MS-20 when I started designing this. And looking back, it's actually, I think it's better this way uh, because it's different. Uh, I, I don't really want to make anything that's an exact clone of anything, uh, to be honest. Also, it, it allows you, and because the high pass filter is lost, it allows you to better put that to use to give a low boost to, if you're making a bass voice, let's say, you can use the resonance peak of the high pass filter to, to, to boost the low frequencies to make it sound really fat. And there's a bit of less chance of distorting that too. So you get a clean uh, bass boost. Um, of course, if you crank the gain, that goes out the window. But if you want to have a kind of clean boost, that's uh, that's possible. Cool. It's um, it's nice to see how by designing it this way, you're actually making sure that the sound you're looking for. Um, it's like what you said about uh, uh, tuning tuning the the module can be quite tricky. Um, but you're doing quite a bit of the tuning by making the design like that. Yeah, but we, you have to excuse me. UPS is here. I'll be right back. Okay. Sorry about that. Those are components I really need today. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. Um, yeah, let's maybe go through. Uh, let's go through more sketches. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is the block schematic of the modulation matrix. It uh, shows you how everything can be switched, how everything fits together uh, on a CV. Oh, sorry, I have to catch my breath running up and down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, so this is the modulation matrix that kind of shows how all the CV sources are connected together, how they can be switched with those uh, modulation matrix switches. Um, when people look at this the, the first time, they usually uh, feel a bit like, blows my mind, uh, because it is looking a bit complex. Um, so I, I do have the impression that sometimes people are put off a little bit by this block schematic. Uh, that is until they 
they they get the filter itself and start playing it and then somehow it it clicks and they're all like uh, i wouldn't want to miss this anymore so yeah <laughs> it exists for for uh, documentation but it's not really a a good marketing material let's say well i think it depends on on the target audience it's quite complex it might be that people look at it like oh it's just it's an ms20 filter but there is actually quite a lot of functionality in this modulation and i think that's what really makes it so unique uh, rather than uh, than the sweet spots and the, how it sounds but yeah. like these ideas are actually pretty interesting and and very clever cleverly set up in such a small module that um yeah for for sound design purposes this is perfect Funnily enough, um, what I found when I was getting started is that even though I did my very best to communicate uh, all of this, it's quite, uh, well, it's quite challenging because in these days, the, the attention span of viewers on YouTube is so limited that, yeah, you have to make an impression with the sound and then with hope that they stick around for your explanation about the features. Yeah. And, and as a, a small shrimp at the time, uh, well, I am still a small shrimp, <laughs> but um, yeah, as a beginner, it was not easy to, to grasp people's attention. And luckily by, by um, the filter gaining some momentum, uh, that has somewhat improved. <laughs> but um, getting those first few filters sold was was actually quite challenging uh, because of that. Yeah, I can imagine the when when you're just trying to get into the market, it can be quite tricky to to do marketing and communication. It's a whole different ball game. Yeah, definitely, and and it does help um, that uh, it did help that I was making something that was quite a bit different from what's out there. Mm -hmm. So that does help. But then trying to explain or, well, getting people to listen long enough to explain everything about it, that's that's a challenge in the beginning. Yeah. So, um, yeah, th this is a first sketch of what the front panel uh, would look like. Um, you see it's not not really final yet. It's not how it ended up being. You do see that the inputs and outputs are the same. Um, there's knobs for the four parameters. Well, no, it's a bit different, actually. I was planning on uh, having a big knob on top for the low pass cu cutoff. Then the other ones under that, and then the attenuators a bit skewed. Um, but yeah, I didn't end up finding that aesthetically pleasing. So I, uh, I kicked that idea out by um, putting the link switch here left to the the, freak, the, the low pass uh, cutoff to harmonize it with the rest. And then this attenuator was also placed in line to be harmonious with the rest. Mm -hmm. You'll also see, by the way, that in this sketch, I'm sketching for the height of the internal PCB, so not the front panel. Mm -hmm. At this point, I was mainly doing the exercise, what can I fit in there uh, based on the, the space that's available on the PCB. Yeah. This was uh, another mock-up. Um, this was a comparison between uh, five and six knobs where one attenuator was kicked out, um, trying to judge a bit if the the six knobs were a bit too dense with respect to the five knobs and a logo. But in the end, I decided that, yeah, I'd rather have more functionality than a pretty logo on there. So uh, it ended up being uh, six knobs. Then here we're going more towards the final version. So what you're seeing on the left here, 
that's actually an export from uh, my PCB design software from a mechanical layer where I had sketched out where the knobs should go, where the switch uh, should go, etc. Then I had exported that into the drawing app I use on my iPad and I started uh, to decorate it uh, on top of that uh, with an Apple pencil. And that's how the, the front panel art came to be. And so the, the black lines are what's printed in silk screen and the red features are uh, what's shown as a uh, copper or uh, well um, well they look a bit silvery because of the the surface yeah. surface finishing so so all these are actually done in the iPad program and then imported into the yeah. PCB layout design then they're sent to Inkscape or affinity right. designer I use now and then those are converted a little bit there and then those are imported into as a footprint into the PCB design software. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, then I have some pictures of prototypes as well. So uh, on the left, there was a first mock-up with the laser cut panel and then a few potential motors. So there's no PCB behind it. Then here on the right was, I'm exa not exactly sure if this prototype was functional or not. I don't think so. Mm. Um, but here you see me experimenting with the, the kind of knobs that I was going to use initially. I had a different color of, of uh, for the CV attenuators. Mm -hmm. But then people told me that they didn't like this. They, they like, preferred the black knobs. So I ended up using those. And yeah, it's one way of signifying um, that these are different. Like you, you see it with mutable inf instruments, for instance, using only the small knobs for it, or you can make, um, you can highlight with visuals. Um, yeah, but I, I can see why people will be like, yeah, it's, it's less consistent. Yeah. Yeah. My initial thought was exactly as you say, like it's nice that they indicate that their behavior is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, majority of people who I talked to, to about this uh, was very clear that um, aesthetics went over function in this. Uh, Were you in doing this? this uh, interesting. Uh, uh, yeah. So, so <laughs> sorry. So did you actually do user testing during this process? No. Not, so how did you get not for this module? So, so how did you get this feedback? I did show some people uh, pictures. And so I got some feedback on the aesthetics, mm. um, but not on the functionality. That is, I got some ideas for the functionality from people, but I didn't really uh, let them test it. Also, keep in mind, uh, at this stage, I was assembling these uh, completely by hand, including yeah. the, the surface mount components. And it took me about eight hours to build one. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> so I didn't really feel like uh, sending out a lot of them. Um, <laughs> no, of course. That, um, it's, yeah. It took an awful long time to build. Yeah. I still have a time lapse of that somewhere else on my YouTube uh, channel. Uh, you, you should check that out. Yeah, I think that you might have gotten different feedback if you would test it with people, just giving them two different options or giving a group of people one option, a group of people another option and seeing how, how, the, how much they understand of the module. It's something mm -hmm. that, that we do more in, in digital design because it's much easier to test. You can just make a, just a different layout in a split of a second and you can just try and see if it works with this. Uh, I bet it's much harder to do it. Just like you said, it's like it's eight hours to build it. Um, but I think that there is value in it when you're building something larger. Um, 
you know like mm-hmm. when when you have your own like i know that uh, a company like arturia for example would actually create uh, paper mockups of the design that don't really work but like you can really feel how things would um like you just you need to interact with it to understand how it works and my and you might get to change different things based on just the behavior of someone looking at it and be like okay let me wrap my head around this what is what is what and yeah you can get a pretty good impression not even with uh without even asking any questions mm-hmm. yeah. yeah there's well you know there's a few sides to this um back then uh basically i didn't know a lot of people in the euro rack community so that would have been a bit difficult to find guinea pigs mm-hmm. um together with it taking a hell of a long time to build one yeah um luckily it has turned out i'm not a bad judge of user interface luckily yeah. um but but i do think that going forward um i am going to ask uh some people's opinions on the new product um it's easier now i know a lot of a lot more people in the community yeah. um i also i've gotten a lot better at having prototypes manufactured yeah so that, that all helps an awful lot in in going about it that way definitely still yeah. uh, a limitation to that is that of course i'm not doing this full time so mm-hmm. i i do have to pick carefully the the kind of projects and uh uh well investigations that i uh, put my time into yeah and and it's also not it's not it's not common what i just said so like most people just mm-hmm. follow their gut feeling and I, I actually thank everybody for that because it's really beautiful what people come up with when they just put their mind into something and just deciding this is what I go for and this is this is what I believe in. Um, it's just, yeah. yeah, it's really just a side note w- that we took way too deep. <laughs> yeah, also Emily from Mutable does this and she does user testing. So I, I did hear about it uh, at some point. So I... Yeah, I might explore that a bit deeper in the future, but there's no there's no time pressure for me, luckily. Yeah. I'm I'm very happy to to help with any of that. I think it's it's really yeah, fun sure. to to look at these Thanks. things. Thanks. Yeah. Um so yeah, here's a here's a picture of the the what the product currently looks like before being assembled. And so all of the SMTs being done by by uh, robot minions. Mm-hmm. Um, the only thing I still solder manually is the the true hole stuff and these uh, four little trimmers because mm-hmm. it uh, it would be too expensive to have that done by the robot yeah. for reasons. Um, and then this is how the kit looks. Uh, so there's also quite a bit of effort going into the the packaging. Um, also, it's uh, all the packaging is purchased, by the way. So now it, th- these are kits that I made for exploding shed. So mm-hmm. it says exploding here. But uh, people who buy a filter or a kit from me, uh, their name is on the packaging. Uh, their name will also be, there is a serial number on the back. Their name also gets written on the back of the module. So that, that's a, a little personal touch that I, I think it's very important. Uh, also to set myself apart as being a, a boutique shop. Yeah. Uh, that it is me you're buying a filter from and, and not really a big kind of company, let's say. It's still a kind of uh personal interaction Mm -hmm. yeah i really appreciate all these uh, small details Uh, who's making the these uh photoshopped uh pictures (laughs) i do yeah (laughs) (laughs) i i i I, yeah i'm i feel i'm lacking the time for it a bit but when i get into the mood i can lose myself into doing this um did you see on my Instagram this the series about uh, 
the Queen and Boris Johnson and, and synthesizers? No. <laughs> I'll try to look <laughs> it up not, and, and go, go check that out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it, it is super silly. I, I made those out of frustration uh, of Brexit happening, yeah. making things more complicated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I believe the one with uh, the the queen in her synthesizer room in Buckingham Palace is my most liked Instagram post ever. <laughs> That's cool. That's great, man. Do you have do you have some more to show there? I think uh, yeah. Here it ends a bit. Uh, here we have this. Uh, yeah, these are some doodles from the my calibration presentation. That's perhaps a bit out of scope for this talk mm -hmm. but yeah they just uh they're a further illustration of me liking to to doodle um, yeah uh, perhaps this is uh kind of nice uh this i didn't show in the exploding shed uh workshop uh this is a first glimpse of how calibration is being done now so in the past, I, I've uh, been calibrating these modules as described in the calibration guide, so with the white noise source, and then looking at them in a spectrum analyzer in a DAW. Um, but I've recently also gotten a, a proper audio analyzer, and this is way more exact. Um, and so you see my test trick here. Uh, I have this benchtop power supply. That's uh, I have this little module that connects it to the rack. Mm -hmm. and I can power two filters from it. The nice thing is that this um, lab supply has uh, protections. So should one of these modules short out, this power supply will immediately kill all supplies mm. so that nothing is damaged. Um, it rarely happens. I usually test the modules with a multimeter before I power them, but on the occasion that I do forget this, this uh, guy is a lifesaver. And then there's an audio analyzer here uh, on the bottom. Um, and that sweeps the, the frequency range uh, going into these filters. And then I can accurately stereo match them as well, if that's necessary. And um, yeah, it's, it's nice. It's it's much more reliable than the DAW method. Um, I'm very happy with it, actually, that I was able to afford that. Um, How long does also, it take to, to calibrate? Mm, it depends a bit. Um, somewhere between 10 and 20 minutes. Okay. And then, uh, stereo pair is, is a bit, uh, two filters take about 30 minutes, 20 minutes, uh, yeah. depends a bit. So that's usually on request. I, I don't do that standardly, uh, but. And that's uh, the door, the, uh, it, on the door or with a spectrum, uh, with, uh, with a digital spectrum analyzer? With the audio analyzer. So I was also able to, to do this in the door, but the audio analyzer is much more precise and okay. also faster okay um yeah i wanted uh, uh, it, it's nice actually to look at the at the other drawings you had there because i think that one of the uh, maybe one of the most interesting things in terms of design and communication when someone starts with diy and and maybe want to create their own instruments or modules is how do you document things and how do you make things clear Just like you said, there was one mm. diagram that was really yeah. confusing for people to look at. Were there some diagrams that you feel like these are really clear and make make it easier for, for someone who doesn't really know how to deal well, with? I, I do get a lot of compliments about the, the build guide. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe I can quickly pull that up as well. So yeah, the build guide is also hand illustrated for a very large portion. Uh, so this is the first page. It also shows you the basic idea of the, the four-layer PCB sandwich of how everything will fit together. Mm -hmm. um, shows you what it should look like when you're done. Um, the, the same block diagrams I've 
shown to you earlier. And then you'll see that if you have a PCB panel set, it starts on this page. And then the people with the full DIY kits, they can skip to uh, the, the last part in mm -hmm. the series. And, and basically this um, build guide, and so I made an export of all the uh, parts on the, uh, on the layout. And I, I just started highlighting them and scratching them through. And so basically this is how the build guide works. Uh, it highlights the ones you should assemble now and mm. then in the next slide they get scratched through. So it's something that I've made by hand. Uh, I've, heard, I've learned since that there are automated ways of doing this, but um, yeah, I kind of like the sentiment of how this works. And I hear from, from many people that they, they kind of like it. So that's a good thing. Um, time for a break. Because <laughs> uh, if you're soldering SMT by hand, it's not a bad idea to do. Um, then here the the part for of the true hole uh, stuff starts. And I think you have to move them a bit pictures. slower because uh, we have a lot of lag. Oh, sorry. So, like, I didn't so. see uh, the, the screen where you said that uh, there is a uh, a small break. Okay, wait. Can you see the time for a break now? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, th these are in here quite a few times, uh, encouraging people to take a break because if you're with your head into SMT soldering, um, after a while you start to make silly mistakes because you're so focused, but getting tired. Um, I and, like it um, that you added this part of the design and you're very aware of, of the situation. Yeah, I, I kind of enjoyed making this this build guide at the time because I could go all out with the hands uh, drawn details and such. Um, looking back, making such a thing for a next module, oof, it's a lot of work. Eh? <laughs> I can so imagine. I, yeah. I do hope that I will will find the energy to crack out another one of these. Uh, so we'll we'll see we'll see um so i'm scrolling down a bit now and so you'll see that the the next part is is pictures with uh hand annotations uh calling things out uh stuff you have to watch out for um there's also this funny drawing of how to properly solder headers so that they're not skewed with a mm -hmm. funny Cyclops drawing. Um, <laughs> hope I can move that a bit. <laughs> yeah, this is me just having fun. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, these are a bit similar. Yeah, I ruined I ruined yeah, these yeah. Uh, sockets on a Befaco module um, on the first uh, design. They're that I difficult. Made. Yeah, it's difficult to fix if you don't have the soldering iron. Um, when when I finally got the desoldering iron myself, and the first time I fixed something like that, I was like, oh my god, this is amazing! <laughs> I didn't I didn't waste an hour or two fixing this. It, only took five minutes. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and there's also a few different methods of doing things either with hot air or with a soldering iron. Uh, I hope that's coming true on your end. Yeah, I'm seeing now. Yeah, N only now I see it. Yeah. So, that's nice. These these are also yeah. really clear. Yeah. So I, I do hear that, that people are quite happy about, mm -hmm. about them. So looking back, I'm, I'm very happy that I put in the effort. Um, yeah, they're quite thorough. Um, I, I do hope that uh, the build complexity of the, the next module will be, will be a bit less than the MS-22. 
because it, it does it, it it is quite a bit of work uh to build them mm -hmm. um, well i do hear that that most people get through the build in 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 about an hour or two so that's a good thing yeah um but I'm mainly talking then about when I produce these. Um, there's still quite a lot of hand soldering involved. So the, the true hole parts, it's definitely not done by a machine. That's really done by myself in a soldering jig. Yeah. And so all those through hole connections, that's me going at it with a, a big knife tip and then bumping them bumping them out <laughs> yeah and 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 i guess that's part of the design as well like the the more you improve maybe there is a way to cut on the time invested in like building the individual ones mm -hmm. i think that yeah the, um, the the biggest efficiency is gained by assembling uh, well quite a few of them in parallel so i i build them either um four of them five of them at the same time mm -hmm. uh, yeah when i'm doing this yeah yeah but if if i if i would reflect on the the documentation you you add here i i wish more people would invent when it would invest more time in making the documentation nicer and and more thought more thoughtful because if you're thinking about it, you're designing this thing once. Yes, maybe it will take a week or two to finish it. But once it's done, then this is forever. Like, you don't need to do this again. It's not like every time that you need to build a module, you need to put like two weeks of work into it. You do it once, you design a really good module, and then you design really good documentation for it. And I would even push it further. Like what I'm trying to do now with students is like the first course I gave them was, um, uh, it doesn't really matter, but every time I'm trying to refine things to make it easier for someone to learn so they can get to, the, to that sweet spot of like, oh, this is really cool. I get this now faster. And I think it has, it's, this, it's a similar experience with someone who is learning how to DIY, how to build things on their own. There are like these sweet spots of the experience that they feel like the designer was thinking about me. This is, this is thoughtful. This is not just uh, another sheet of paper with a bunch of, with a bunch of, with a bunch of uh, resistors and you need to figure everything on your own. Um, and I think it's really meaningful to see something like this. Um, yeah, it's it's twofold. Eh? Um, it's designed for easy manufacturing because I do have to solder them by hand myself, and so that does help me. And with the documentation, yeah, I did I didn't want to uh, throw people into the deep without any help. Um, so that that's part of the reason why this documentation is so elaborate. Mm -hmm. um, to the degree that when you look at the calibration guide that people are a bit uh, intimidated by it. Um, so I, I was very happy actually to be given the chance by Exploding Shed to, to explain that uh, over a call to them. Yeah. And I feel that uh, that explanation is adds so much value to the guide and, and shows a bit yeah the relative importance of of certain things so that, that that was a really nice opportunity because i was dreading a bit uh updating that guide uh because it's usually a trade-off uh, either you make it too complicated and then people are intimidated by it or you make it too simple and then people you you run the risk of people scratching their heads saying uh, what the hell are we doing here so yeah yeah, there's a this thing called the um, the law of conservation of misery. <laughs> Have you heard about that, Rui? I I, I don't think so. It's do, an do share. approach in engineering, the the law of conservation of misery. So let's say you have a project that has mechanical complexities and electronic complexities. 
And usually for most projects, you can, you will find that there's a trade-off between the two. So you can, for instance, shift part of the complexity uh, of the mechanical portion to the electronic portion. Uh, if you have a simple push button, um, people who are not strictly into electronics, um, they, they wouldn't know this, but they're not ideal push buttons. And so they, when you push them, they don't go clack. What they actually do on a microscopic scale is uh, clack, 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 clack. Okay. And then if you don't compensate for that, you will trigger something more, many more times than you intended to. Right. Or it can be because it's a cheap switch. Mm -hmm. But you can solve that by buying a really elaborate uh, switch with dampening and such. Mm -hmm. Or you can filter that out on the electronics side. Right. So law of conservation of misery dictates that if you're good in electronics, you shift the misery to the, the domain where you're strong. Right. So if I'm not a good mechanical engineer who does not know how to buy a good switch or, or just solve that by de designing it properly, I'll say like, you know what, this non-ideal behavior will catch it in on the electronic side because that's where my expertise lies.